If you clicked on this video, there's a good chance that at some point you've heard the result that if you add one plus two plus three plus four plus five on and on up to infinity, that in some way that equals negative one twelfth. Now, obviously this result isn't exactly true. It depends on what we mean by summing up infinitely many numbers. I mean, this is an impossible thing to do. And so how we define summing affects what the final answer is gonna be. But it turns out that there's a whole family of infinite sums that nonetheless equal something usually small and often negative. And today I'm gonna to look at a strange one, that the sum of all powers of two up to infinity equals negative one. Before we look at how we encounter such a strange result, let's remind ourselves about some infinite sums that we already know how to do. So let's take a look at the infinite sum of one, plus a half, plus a fourth, plus an eighth, plus a sixteenth, and so on. Adding all of the reciprocals of powers of two. Now, if you don't already know what this equals, you can figure it out pretty easily by looking at the number line. If we put zero here, and we'll put one here and two here, we can see that adding one is just the same as going from zero to one. Then adding a half to that is the same thing as going from here to one and a half. Adding a quarter to this is the same thing as going a quarter of the distance here to one and three quarters. Adding an eighth moves us half of the way closer to two. Adding a sixteenth gets us closer still. And for every term we add, we're just getting closer and closer to two. And so we say that this infinite sum equals Two. Another way we can get this result is by using a formula. And the formula is that the sum, whatever this infinite series equals, is equal to the first term, we call that s sub zero, in this case it's one, divided by one minus the rate. And the rate is whatever each next number is being multiplied by. So here we see that every new number we're adding is just the previous number, but multiplied by a half. One times a half is a half. A half times a half is a quarter. A quarter times a half is an eighth. So for this sum, our rate, r, is a half. So if we wanted to know what this infinite sum equaled, we just plug in the first term, one, over one minus a half, which would give us one over one half, which is just two. But now what happens if we look at another sum? Let's look at the sum of one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16, on and on adding powers of two. Well, if we go look at the formula, we'll see that whatever this equals, it should be equal to the first term, one, divided by one minus the rate. And in this case, every new number is just being multiplied by two, right? One times two is two, two times two is four, four times two is eight. So the rate is two. And this gives us one over, one minus two is negative one, which equals negative one. Now obviously this can't be true. If I keep adding terms, this just blows up to infinity. I'm adding bigger and bigger numbers. And yet somehow this formula that worked before is now telling us that this answer is gonna be negative one. Now the simple way to fix this problem is just to note that this formula only works when r is less than one. So in our previous example, when r was a half, this formula worked. And now that r is greater than one, it doesn't work. Well, what if I told you that there's a system of numbers where this really is the right answer? There's a system of numbers where if you add one plus two plus four plus eight and so on, all the powers of two, you really do get closer and closer to negative one. The system of numbers is called p-adic numbers, where the p stands for some prime. So you could have 13 adic numbers, or seven adic numbers, or two adic numbers. And in this world of p-adic numbers, sizes and scales and distances are all contorted. It's like the Alice in Wonderland of numbers. 
In the two attic system, for example, four is farther away from five than it is from eight. So how do we get p attic numbers? Well, to start, let's remind ourselves what happens when we try to do arithmetic with infinity. Infinity is kind of slippery, and what I mean by that is that if we add one to infinity, well, that's still equal to infinity. If we multiply infinity by two, well, we still have infinity. If we try dividing infinity by two, we still get infinity. So it seems like there's nothing I can do to change the fact that what I have is infinity. Well, this is where p-adic numbers come in. Let's imagine I have some number that starts with a three, and then there's another three, and another three, and another three, and another three, and we let this number go on to the left forever, for infinity. This is an infinitely large number. But what happens if I try to multiply it by two? Well, I'll get two times three is six, two times three is six, and six again, and six again. Obviously, this is just an infinite string of sixes. So it seems like we multiplied this number by two and definitely got something new. But remember, this number is infinitely big, and so is this one. Infinity times two is still infinity. But now it looks like this is a different infinity. It's almost like, in this sense, we can do arithmetic with infinity. But in p-adic systems, we use the base of whatever p-system we're in. So if we're in a three-adic system, we're going to use base three numbers. So we might have the number two, 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 all the way to infinity going off to the left. And we might want to add it to one. Now, in a base 10 system, when we add one to our largest digit, which is nine, we roll over, we get one zero. In a base three system, when we add one to our biggest digit, which is now two, we roll over, and again, we get one zero. I can add these two digits again, this is an addition table, to get, well, one zero, and then I'll add these to get one zero, and this will go on forever. I just get an infinite string of zeros. So it seems like if I add an infinite string of twos to one, that I get zero. And what we actually just did was learn something really important about p-adic numbers, is that we can have negative numbers without actually having a negative sign anywhere. In the three-adic system, this number is acting like negative one. And now I briefly want to talk about the notion of convergence, because it's important in p-adic numbers. When we were looking at the infinite sum of one plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on, that infinite sum was converging on two. The more terms we added, the closer our final answer got to two. So let's think about the sum of three plus 30 plus 300 plus 3000 and so on, adding another zero each time. It seems like this number is just gonna blow up to infinity, but for every new term we add, let's see what we get. We start with three, and if I add the next term, I'll get 33. If I add the next term, I'll get 333. If I add the next term, I'll get 3,333. And eventually, I've just got what I had before, this infinite string of threes. It might feel to you that in some way, this infinite sum was converging on this number, even though this number was infinitely big. If you were discovering all of this stuff on your own for the first time, you might posit that what allowed us to multiply this infinitely large number by two to actually get something meaningful was that this number was an infinite sum that converged. It was this infinite sum that converged to this. 
So now that we've seen some things where we were able to do math with seemingly infinite numbers, let's try to do some math with the sum we started with. 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 and so on. Remember, we were able to do math with the 3 plus 30 plus 300 because that infinite sum seemed to converge on some infinitely large number as we were adding terms. So let's start adding together these terms and see if anything converges. Well, we start off with just 1. Then when we add the first two terms, we get 3. If we add the next, we get 7. If we add the next one, we get 15. And then adding 16 to this, we would get 31. Continuing this, we would get 63 and 127, 255. This doesn't seem to be converging on anything. Maybe it would if we added more and more terms, but unfortunately it just doesn't. This number never settles on something the way the other sum settled on an infinite string of threes. So let's remind ourselves real quick what we mean by writing numbers in different base systems. If I have 417 in base 10, well, what that means is that I have 4 times 10 squared, right, that's 400, plus 1 times 10 to the 1, right, that's just 10, plus 7 times 10 to the 0. This is just a fancy way of saying 1. 400 plus 10 plus 7 is just 417. And this is how we do this no matter what base system we're in. So if I was in a base 3 system and I wrote down the number 201, well, this wouldn't be the 201 we're familiar with. What this is really is 2 times 3 squared plus 0 times 3 to the 1 plus 1 times 3 to the 0. So what the 2, 0, and 1 represent is what we're multiplying each of these powers of 3 by as the powers of 3 go down. And now we finally get to tie everything we've learned together. We saw earlier that we weren't able to get 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8, all the powers of 2, to converge on something the way we were able to get all of those 3 times 10 to the somethings to converge on an infinite string of 3s. But maybe that's just because we're looking at it from the wrong angle. We're looking at this infinite sum in base 10. Maybe we should be looking at it in base 2, or a 2-attic attic system. So if I've got 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8, well, in base 2, what I really have is 1 times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 cubed, and so on. And so in base 2, this infinite sum can be represented as 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And now, doing the convention where the powers are getting bigger as we go to the left, like they normally are, this would just be an infinite string of 1s, just like our infinite string of 3s. And now, for the final piece to the puzzle, let's see what happens if we add this infinite string of 1s that we know that this sequence equals to 1. Well, in base 2, remember the biggest digit that we have is 1, and so we roll over. 1 plus 1 in base 2 is 1, 0. 1 plus 1 is 1, 0. 1 plus 1 again is 1, 0 and 1, 0. So this infinite string of 1s is nothing more than negative 1, so long as we're looking in a 2-attic system. So just to tie some things in full circle, when we were looking at that formula earlier that was giving us negative 1, that wasn't an accident. The derivation of that formula works for values of r, that number in the denominator, greater than 1, if you're in different 
number systems where these infinite sums actually converge. So it's not just a coincidence. It's just that that formula will only work if you're in the right number system where the sum is converging. Okay, so if it feels like I glossed over too many details way too fast, it's because I did. There's really a lot going on here and I wanted to just get us to a cool result without going into too much detail that would burden the whole video. But maybe I'll make a video about some of those details later on. So let me know if you guys want me to make another video talking about some of the more fine details of p-adic numbers and thanks for watching.